If you have your Bibles, why don't y'all open with me to Mark chapter 3, and we'll start in verse 20. If you see your outline, Jesus, demons, family, and the Pharisees, should be fun, right? Um, To talk through Jesus, his family, some family issues, some demons, Pharisees, and we're just lumping it all in there together to see where the Lord takes us, see what we see from these uh, really interesting passages of Scripture. And so let's dive in here together. Mark chapter 3, if you have your outline, pull it out, and you can take some notes there. Mark chapter 3, starting in verse 20, and let's work our way through verse 35. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. And his family heard about it. They went out to seize him, for they were saying, he is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, he is possessed by Beelzebul. And by by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in the parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter into a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed, he may plunder his house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness and is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brother came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and my sister and my mother. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, help us this morning. Would help us, again, not learn more information about you, but would it soak into our hearts and would we be changed because of what we've learned and sung about today? Our heart's goal and our heart's cry is for our heart to simply be open wide, for your word to be like a, like a drop of water in the parched desert, just to nourish and quench our soul. So help us, Lord, with the words of my mouth and with the meditations of my heart Be pleasing to you, Lord. You are our rock and our redeemer. And it's in your name we pray, amen. So let's go uh, for a moment and look back. Last week we talked about Jesus calling the disciples and he called his 12 apostles to himself. And these were the guys that were gonna walk with Jesus everywhere that he was gonna go. They were gonna experience discipleship and see Jesus do miraculous works and signs and wonders. These were gonna be the apostles that were gonna set the world on fire by their proclamation of this testimony. Jesus has had people all around him. We talked about what it must have been like for Jesus to go anywhere and people just pressing all around him, sick and hurting and maimed and lame, just all around Jesus all the time. And so here we progress and you see that Jesus comes home and this crowd gathered around him again so they couldn't even eat and his family heard about it and they're going out to seize him. Now for a moment, we're gonna, we're gonna lay this scripture to the side for a moment. We're gonna pick it back up at the end because you see 31 through 35 has some similar, similar links. So let's first look at verses 22 through, 20, uh, through 30. Same vein, same thing, but we're gonna ask three important questions. Now I think this is just where I am, dad life, right? That everything and every day is just a lot of questions, right? Can I eat this? Can I do this? Can I slide down this? Can you push me? Can we swing? Can we do this? So, Here we are, right? I have three questions today for y'all because I could ask a billion questions myself on a daily basis. That's where we are, all right? Everybody okay with that? (laughs) Okay. Let's just pack it on up. We'll go on home. Everybody okay with that? (laughs) All right. Goodness gracious. Long morning. All right. So first question. First question. How does Jesus cast out demons? This is the first question that we want to ask because we see the Pharisees be a little upset with Jesus casting out these demons. Now, if you see on your outline, let's take for a moment because we see Jesus in Luke chapter 11 give a little more clarity in what's just happened. Right? Just, just like last week, the book of Luke gave us a little more clarity into Mark. Remember, Mark is no nonsense. He gives us what we need to hear. And sometimes the book of Luke and other gospels give us a little more clarity into what's happening at different times. Right? Mark wants us to see this is 
Jesus. He's the Messiah. He's the authority. This is what Mark over and over, not this Mark, but writer of gospel Mark, wants us to get across. And so look on your outlines. Luke chapter 11, you see a little more insight into this situation. Now, Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub and the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking him a sign from heaven. So you see here that Jesus has just healed a man who is mute by a demon. So he's called this demon out, and the people are marveling at what they're seeing. They're marveling at this man who has cast out demons, who has done incredible signs and wonders. So then the question is, how does Jesus cast out a demon? Now, I want to bring up an important point here that at no point, as we've seen week after week, chapter after chapter, is anybody discounting these miracles that Jesus is doing. At no point are the people like, hey, he's not really doing these things, right? This is some kind of hokey magic that he's doing. It's not really real. It's kind of like an illusion. It's not really happening. Jesus really isn't doing these signs. He's just, he's pulling the wool over your eyes and then doing something in secret, no? I mean, think about what Jesus has done, right? He's, he's taken a man with a withered hand and instantaneously healed him, touched a man with leprosy, and what happens? It wasn't a year or two later that this man got better. It was instantaneously this man was healed of leprosy. So nobody is discounting the fact that Jesus is doing miraculous signs and wonders everywhere he's going. The problem is, how's he doing it? Now, I don't know if you've ever been in the shoes uh, at some point in your life where you've said words like this. If, if God would just, if he would just write his name in the clouds, then we'd believe, right? You ever done that? Gracious people, come on, man. Am I the only one who's doing anything? All right, so ever had those times where you walk out and you say, if God would just call fire down from heaven and consume some bad place, or if God would just do some crazy thing and write his name in the clouds, or you know, wake up one day and say, God, if you have this in order and this, then I'll truly believe you. Have you ever done that before? I mean, maybe I am the only one. I don't know, okay? I'm living my life. That's just how I am, all right? So I, I don't know, but we, we, we long for at times to see a sign from God, right? We think, God, if you would just do this, then I'll always believe in you. If you would do this incredible sign, then I would truly believe. God, if you would do this thing in the clouds, if you would just show your grace in the clouds one day, then all of the world would finally believe you. I mean, I've had those thoughts before. God, if you would just show yourself powerfully and mightily in this world, then everybody would have no choice but to believe you. I've thought it before. And then you come to a passage like this and say, well, it just wouldn't work. I mean, look at Jesus going constantly, doing these incredible signs and wonders, healing people with a withered hand, and all of a sudden, instantaneously, it's healed, touching a person with leprosy. And not walking away and waiting years and years for this leprosy to resolve, but instantaneously healed. A mute man, instantaneously healed. Where the only question is not, not is this right or happening, is where is this power coming from? See, the Pharisees are looking face to face with the God of this universe who created all things and instantaneously is miraculously showing and demonstrating who he is, giving sign after sign after sign and wonder after wonder after wonder, yet the people don't see it. See, in some days we just think, God, if you would just do this, finally the people would believe. He did, and the people didn't believe. And so you come to this and you you say, Pharisees, how can you miss this? How can you miss God in front of you doing all this? And yet you choose to say, not, is this the son of God? But this can't be the son of God. This has got to be a demon. More than that, the prince of demons. So you look at this and again, the Pharisees are not discounting that Jesus is doing these signs, but they're in essence ascribing to Jesus that he's demonic. More than that, that he is the prince of demons, that he is Satan himself who's able to cast out these demons. And Jesus, in all the right ways, just like Jesus does, disarms everybody with a parable. Right, a simple thing, he could have said, hey guys, you're wrong, but instead he he calls out a parable. 
And he says, hey, this is how lunacy, what you're saying is, if I was on team demon, why would I kill the demons? Yesterday, uh, we had a t-ball game and Micah got his first game ball for not, I think he didn't skip from first base to second base. He actually ran, so he got a game ball, right? And so if you've ever done t-ball before, you know that there's something beautiful that happens in the outfield anytime there's a ground ball that goes out there, right? You know what it is? All the kids converge on that little ball and they all jump on top of each other and they fight over the ball, right? It's the best part of t-ball, the best. That's why, that's why you pay to go, right? Because you want to see the kids fighting over the ball on the same team, right? And while they're out there in the outfield fighting over the ball, you know what's happening? Those kids just run around the bases, scoring runs, right? And they don't care. They're just picking daisies and trying to fight over the ball. But that's what happens when a team fights over the ball, a, a, another team scores and scores and scores and scores. And in no way is this the same thing. T-ball is not the same thing about what happens in the heavenlies. But Jesus is saying, hey, if I was the prince of demons, why would I kill? Why would I uh, do harm to my own team? It makes no sense. In essence, Jesus is coming to say, the reason why I can cast out demons is because I have authority over the demons. Again, we've been like a lot of weeks into this whole book of Mark thing, and we're seeing time and time and week after week after week, prevailing themes of Jesus demonstrating his authority over so many things. Remember, authority over the word as he spoke in the synagogue, authority over the word to say, man, this guy has authority like we've never seen before, authority over disease, authority over demons. Again, 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 authority. Jesus has the authority. He's not the prince of demons. He's the authority over demons. So Jesus gives this beautiful, rational argument to say, how can Satan cast out Satan? Man, you're missing it completely. No one can enter into a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man's and then he can plunder his house. The very thing that Jesus has come to do to win the victory over death, disease, and the devil. So how does Jesus cast out demons? He casts out demons because he is authoritative over demons, over disease, over this world. So let's then go to this next question that I know is pressing. This next question is, what won't God forgive? You see, Jesus says this wonderful parable of Satan. uh, How could he rise up against himself if a house is divided? How can it stand? But it's coming to an end. And then he says in verse 28, listen intently. Jesus says, truly, I say to you. When Jesus says truly, the word is just amen. He's saying, amen, this is big, amen, truly. Everything Jesus says is true, but he's emphasizing how true this truly is, right? Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whoever blasphemies, they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. Now, much ink has been spilled on verse 29 and 30. We talk about it a lot. In my office over the years, I've gotten several emails and calls and questions of people, believers, who have said, I'm worried. This this verse scares me to death that maybe I've crossed the line. I've done something that cannot be forgiven. You know how often people come and say, I don't think, you know, I'm too far gone. I'm the one person that God could never forgive because I've sinned too much. You know, we waste a lot of time and looking at verse 29 by itself. Frustrated and worried about crossing the line of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And it's important. We, we read it and there's a, there's a dire warning here not to cross the line of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. There, there's a warning there. We don't ever want to be guilty of something that would never be forgiven. But if you take verse 29 outside of verse 28, we have a problem. See, verse 28 is true to the characteristic and heartbeat of who God is. Truly, amen and amen, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. See, this is the crux of this passage. And at times when you have difficulty understanding some difficult passages, you look at what's around it and you look at the totality of scripture to see verse 28 is ringing with truth after truth, truth that you know and I know. That as believers, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That we know that we have not yet out the cross of Christ. Not that we're trying, but we can't do it. 
that in Christ there is not sin that we can simply not be forgiven when we are trusting Jesus with our lives, when we are repenting of our sin, when we're going after Jesus and we're not allowing our heart to be hardened by sin. See, as verse 30 comes, it says, for they were saying he has an unclean spirit. The Pharisees had hardened their heart. They were ascribing bad to good and good to to bad. They were saying that Jesus had an unclean spirit, that he was unclean, that he was demonic. The Pharisees, as you see just in verse or chapter 3, continue to harden their heart to the point that they refuse repentance in their life. So often the people that are most worried about blaspheming the Holy Spirit are those who are furthest from it. So we've seen over and over again that when we, when we desire when we grieve over sin in our lives, when we hurt with it, when we say, God, I'm sorry, I repent of this sin. You don't find precedent with Jesus where a sinner comes to him and says, Lord, forgive me of my sins. I've fallen short. Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done. You don't see precedent with Jesus in the scripture where he turns a sinner who is repentant away. You just don't see it. You don't see a place in Scripture where somebody is coming to God and saying, God, I have sinned and fallen short. I need your forgiveness. And God's saying, I'm sorry. It's over. It's over for you. And what that tells me is, friends, when you come and say, God could not love me. I've fallen too far. I've I've done too much. There's too much that I've done that God surely could not forgive me. Surely I've done what is unforgivable. Surely I am too far gone. Know that scripturally you are not that God desires all would come and seek repentance, that God desires all to be saved and come to the knowledge of him. God desires his people to repent and come to faith and salvation. And so friends, don't turn your back on the Lord. Don't harden your heart against his calling in your life. This is not a a one-time deal that you utter and then you're completely unforgivable. It is a life of hardening your heart and turning your back against the repentance and calling of the Lord in your life. Friends, this morning, verse 28 is important. Verse 29 is important. But we understand the reality of who God is that every day, as you awoke this morning, if you were in Christ, the mercy of the Lord was new for you today. That you have not exhausted the grace of God in your life and you will not. That's how good he is. That's how grace-filled he is. So as we come to this next portion, it it ties so beautifully here together. Mark chapter 3 and and verse 20, you see that the crowds were coming together and his his family went out to to seize him because they're saying he's out of his mind. They're still not understanding. He's not even eating. So the family comes out to to seize him. And then he says all this about Elzebul and about the Pharisees. And you come down to 31 and his mother and brothers came out standing outside this house and they called into him. They sent someone in to get him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking around at those who sat around him, said, Here, here are my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister. So let's ask this final question Who is Jesus' family? Who is Jesus' family? Now, at times you've looked at this passage, and I've looked at this passage, and kind of thought a little bit about, Hey, Jesus, this isn't very nice, man. These are your, that's your mom. These are your brothers. And they're coming to you to get you. Now they're coming to seize him, but they're coming to, to get him. And he says, who are my mother and brothers and sisters? I mean, if, if your son was in somewhere and you called for him and you said, who's my mom and my brother and sisters? Would you be a little offended? Mom's out there? Oh, man, no mom's out there. Okay. We'll get it eventually, all right? So you'd be a little offended. But I believe what Jesus is doing is far more important than just calling a negative towards his mom and his brother and his sisters. See, he looks at the people who are sitting in front of him, disciples who are following him. And he says, here, here are my mother and my brothers and my sisters right in front of me because they're doing the will of God, the calling in their life, And he essentially opens up the family of faith to those who are following him. 
no longer tied to blood relation, but simply opening it up. Just a few months ago, um, we had a baptism. Andy baptized his son up in the baptistry up here, and uh, it's just stuck with me over these past few weeks that Andy said a, a beautiful line in that baptism. Looked at his son and said, you're, you're still my son by blood, but today you're my brother. There's something that happens when we come to faith. Your kids become your brother. Your, your daughter becomes your sister when, you, when they walk with Jesus. There's a reason why at the end of every service we invite people to come and be a part of a family of faith. It's not just a word that we say. It's not just something that we talk about, a family of faith. Oh, it's a great family of faith. No, we are brothers and sisters in the faith. This is a beautiful thing that God has given us. As brothers and sisters, we walk with one another. We encourage one another. We, we walk through life's ups and downs together. You see, we have a singular purpose here. And what is it? To do the will of God. See, as you came into this room, we are brothers and sisters, and your singular goal, your singular goal, my singular goal, everyone in this place, our singular goal is what? To do the will of God in our lives. That's our goal. That's why you come in here. And our goal together is that we would do it together better, that we would encourage one another, follow Jesus today, follow Jesus better and together. As you walk through difficulties and life's ups and downs, as you you struggle, then you encourage each other as a family would and should. As you mourn, we grieve with you. When you're down, we we lift one another up. When you have moments of rejoicing, what do you do? We rejoice alongside you as a family would. When you have hard news, we share it together as a family so we can encourage one another. This is a family of faith. And you know as well as I do that sometimes, sometimes family is difficult, right? You see Jesus here. He's got some family problems. They're coming to seize him. But our singular thing that binds this place together and that binds Little C and Big C Church together is our singular focus and desire to do the will of God in our lives. You know, as I look out on you, I I need to walk with you through this life as, as a brother and sister in the faith to be encouraged together. I need your encouragement of what it looks like to walk through the journey that you've walked. It encourages me. And the beautiful thing as we sit out right here is that we are all together, brothers and sisters, whether you are the lowliest of lowly in this society or whether you're the highest of high in this society, together we sit on the pews together with a singular focus, and that is to follow Jesus. It's the beautiful thing about a family of faith, a body of Christ, is that we come together with a singular focus We've not come to be entertained. We've not come to have our needs met. We've come to have the singular need of following Jesus and doing it better together. So I've asked three questions, but let me ask a question for each of you. A question for us would simply be, are you part of God's family? In multiple ways, are you part of God's family in that have you trusted in Jesus and are you doing God's will for your life? Are you following Jesus and desiring to do his will in your life? Don't think about the person next to you or the person behind you. Think about yourself. Are you following Jesus and are you a part of his family? Secondarily to that, have you committed to a faith family? A family of faith that would encourage you and walk with you. If it's not this church, I pray that you would find a church that you could be committed to, plugged into, because we need you and you need us. We need to walk through life's journeys together. And so I'll ask you, are you part of God's family? Have you trusted in Jesus and walking with him? Today would be a great day to become part of God's family by either trusting in Jesus for the very first time or becoming part of a family of faith that would encourage you in that walk. But secondly, are you welcoming others in? Are you welcoming others to be a part of this family of faith? I don't know about y'all, but when you talk about a family, sometimes it's, it's hard to welcome others in, right? We have these things called in-laws, right? Sometimes they're called outlaws uh, in different families. You know how sometimes it's difficult to bring in uh, a wife or a husband into a new family. There's traditions that you have to talk about, whether you're going to put white lights on the Christmas tree or colored lights on the Christmas tree or uh, who you'll spend family holidays with and all that kind of stuff. There's, there's some things that come up when you welcome people into a family, right? Same is true of a church. 
We have things that we do here that sometimes people understand and sometimes they don't. And so what do you have to do? You welcome people in. This is an inviting family of faith. And so more importantly to welcoming people into this church, are you welcoming people into God's family of faith by telling and showing and demonstrating the gospel with your life? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, help us. Lord, we want to trust in you. We want to follow you with our life. Lord, we don't want to harden our heart against you. So would you mold our hearts into your image? Lord, I I want to just confess, and I, I pray that we would as a church confess that we want our hearts to be open and moldable into your will. So Lord, if there's ways in which I'm off the path, Lord, would you correct me? Lord, would you forgive me where I've fallen short? Lord, we don't want to be guilty of living our lives in disobedience, refusing repentance, refusing accountability and change in our hearts and going on our own way. Lord, would you break our hearts for you? We thank you for how you teach us through your word, Lord, how we see your hand of grace open to all. Lord, we thank you that you don't refuse those who would come to you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your son, Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.